are you? Good morning. Welcome this morning. Um, I'm Ken Wallach, president of NDI, and I wanted to welcome you to what promises to be a timely and informative discussion on democracy and disinformation, uh, which is the theme for NDI's 25th Democracy Award dinner uh, tomorrow evening, at which we will be honoring the three panelists who you will be hearing from this morning. Uh, Margot Guntor of Stop Fake in Ukraine, Maria Ressa of Rappler in the Philippines, and Phil Howard of the Oxford Internet Institute at the University of Oxford. I wanted to thank Politico for being the media sponsor for this event, and Susan Glasser, Politico's chief columnist, for moderating the panel and for interviewing Senator Cardin. Uh, we now know that the initial views about the impact of technological change were incomplete. There were those who had presented a cyber utopian or cyber optimistic view of the impact of social media on democracy, whereby increased internet access would inevitably lead to more open societies. This has now given way to perhaps a more realistic, if not darker view. As Wael Ghanim, the Democratic activist whose Facebook posts helped ignite the Egyptian revolution, uh, warns, social media, he said, was once seen as a liberating means to speak truth to power. Now the issue is how to speak truth to social media. Uh, each of our awardees and the organizations which they lead are all responding to this call, sometimes at great personal risk. For its part, NDI launched its Infotegrity Initiative in Palo Alto last spring. Through this initiative, we are providing tools and other assistance to hundreds of civic groups worldwide, representing four million citizen monitors to detect and expose disinformation being spread to subvert democratic elections. We are connecting political and civic groups across borders and regions who can learn from each other and support each other in the fight for truth online and through other mediums. We are carrying out new types of public opinion research that can identify populations that are most vulnerable to disinformation and find the most effective ways to reach them with facts. In other words, to build resistant, resilience. And from our office in Silicon Valley, we are working with technology companies to what we call design for democracy to find ways to reduce the abuse of their platforms for disinformation purposes, something Senator Cardin has taken a lead on. We are certainly not alone in this effort. This is a global challenge that requires a concerted and multifaceted response. Now, given that our two of our three awardees are journalists, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that our dinner tomorrow coincides with the UN's International Day to end impunity for crimes against journalists. Uh, the day will also memorialize the more than 900 journalists who have been killed in the past 11 years for their reporting. So I would now like to turn our program over to Rob Libertor, uh, the treasurer of NDI's board of directors, who will introduce Susan and Senator Cardin. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our two discussants. Um, in Senator Ben Cardin, we have someone who has spent his life as a legislator and a, a public servant. He has been a legislator for over 50 years, first elected to the Maryland House of Delegates in 1966, served in the Maryland House for 20 years, was one of the youngest speakers ever of the uh, Maryland House of Delegates. And then in 1986, he was elected uh, to represent a district in Baltimore, uh, where he served in the House for 20 years. And then in uh, 2006, was elected to the US Senate. He's one of our, uh, the nation's foremost 
Foreign Policy Voices. As the ranking member, he would be chairman if the Democrats took back the Senate, of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I mean, we, we don't, you know, we're not partisan here at NDI. Um, he has worked across party lines to advance national security, and he's been an outspoken leader in protecting universal human rights. Senator Cardin has served on the U.S. Helsinki Committee Commission since 1993 and has been chairman on two occasions. In 2015, he was named Special Representative on Anti-Semitism, Racism, and Intolerance for the 56th Nation Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe Parliamentary Assembly. Senator Cardin has denounced Russian military aggression in Ukraine and Syria, actions that violated international commitments and showed clear disregard for the sovereignty and humanitarian norms. Together with Senator John McCain, he introduced and passed the Magnitsky Act, the single most important piece of legislation to impact Russia since Jackson Vanek, to ensure that there would be consequences for violating human rights. After Russia's interference in the 2016 U.S. presidential election, Senator Cardin immediately began a bipartisan effort to strengthen comprehensive sanctions. With his knowledge of foreign policy, human rights, cybersecurity, and hybrid warfare, Senator Cardin is the perfect panelist to address those topics this morning. The moderator <coughs> of our discussion is a noted journalist, Susan Glasser, who currently serves as Politico's chief international affairs columnist and host of the weekly podcast, Global Politico. Susan served as the founding editor of Politico magazine and editor throughout the 2016 election cycle. She has reported from the halls of Congress to the Battle of Tora Bora. She has deep knowledge, deep and vast knowledge of Russian politics and foreign affairs. She spent four years traveling the former Soviet Union as the Washington Post Moscow Bureau uh, co-bureau chief and discovered and covered the wars of in Iraq and Afghanistan. She co-authored Kremlin Rising, Vladimir Putin and the End of Revolution with her husband, the New York Times Chief White House Correspondent Peter Baker. Also, if any of you had the opportunity to watch the PBS two-part special on Putin. Um, Susan is very prominently fe featured in the first section. The second second piece airs tonight. It's really a terrific uh, program, so go back and watch it if you haven't had a chance to watch it tonight. Uh, during her tenure as Editor-in-Chief of, Far of Foreign Policy, the magazine was recognized as a finalist for 10 National Magazine Awards, and it won three of the magazine's world's highest honors. Before that, Susan worked at the Washington Post. She doesn't look old enough to have done all this stuff, um, where she was a foreign correspondent, editor uh, of the Post Sunday Outlook, a national uh, news section, and a political reporter. She began her career at Roll Call, Roll Call covering the U.S. Congress. So please join me in welcoming Senator Ben Cardin and Politico's Susan Glasser. Are we, Susan, you want to see her? Well, Rob, first of all, thank you very much for that uh, very generous in introduction. Ken, thank you for your leadership here at NDI. Susan, it's good to be with you. Uh, let me just uh, at least try to wake you up by saying uh, you don't, I don't think America fully understands or even closely understands the danger of disinformation and the concerted efforts uh, that our enemies are waging in order to affect our system of government. I want to thank NDI because you have been a champion on building democracies by strengthening political parties and civil societies and in, uh, engaging in dialogue between uh, elected officials, uh, freely elected officials, 
uh, in the public. That's critical to a democracy. And we need to acknowledge today that we have enemies that are trying to compromise our democratic systems of government by using our democracy, our democratic institutions against ourselves. So you'll see reports, Russia's interference in the United States elections, what Russia's doing in other parts of the world, or different bits and pieces, but what you don't really focus on that this is a designed effort by our enemies using many, many tools in order to use disinformation to really bring down our system of government and expand their influence globally. So it, it's a pretty sophisticated effort. And to give, give you a little bit of a tease, Damian Murphy is here as a staff from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. We uh, intend to issue a report from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee later this year that will outline in a pretty comprehensive way what one of our enemies, Russia, is doing uh, in regards to the disinformation and uh, their efforts, not just in the United States, but globally. I also want to congratulate the three honorees that will be on the next panel who are really on the front lines uh, uh, and, and experience personally uh, these, uh, these issues. R Russia, to me, is the most dangerous country in the, the misinformation. Uh, they are, operate in many countries, a, a, a Marshall Fund study, uh, recently indicated that within the last two decades, there's been 27 countries in Europe and North America that Russia has been uh, directly engaged in. Uh, the, the misinformation, uh, they use all types of, of vehicles from silencing those that would tell the truth, taking them out, discrediting them, using Russia-controlled media to spread misinformation, using propaganda, uh, using funding proxies in order to uh, deal with misinformation. And there are many, many examples uh, that we can point to around the world, but making up stories in order to get uh, an anti-immigrant uh, sentiment, as we saw in Germany, to uh, planning uh, uh, misinformation about a journalist who was just disclosing the, their troll farm operations in Finland, uh, to directly financing uh, elections in Montenegro to try to disrupt uh, the uh, Montenegro's accession into, into NATO. Uh, they were directly involved in the Brexit to encourage and with misinformation in order to support the, the, the exit uh, Brexit campaign. So they're directly involved in these issues. The question is, we, what do we do about this? And I'll just outline uh, just very briefly, we got to improve our resiliency against this attack. And it starts with a free press and investigative reporting. So I'm very pleased that this forum is at the museum. Uh, to me, the key is to get the investigative information and support investigative reporting. We also need to be realistic and understand uh, the attacks that are against us. So as we've built a very strong military defense against our enemies, such as NATO and our alliances around the world, we need to build that type of resiliency, uh, recognizing the protection of our democracy. This, the Congress started that uh, in the bill we recently passed, authorizing $250 million for a fund uh, to work with our European friends uh, to build cybersecurity and to build uh, an anti-propaganda uh, campaign so that we can counter the attacks that we're finding against our own uh, country. And then lastly, there's a common theme that we see in almost all these campaigns, and it's corruption. We really need to address the issues of corruption globally. And there's some legislation that we're authoring this year to try to deal with that, to get a better grip on it. Russia, the people of Russia are wonderful people. I'm sure recognize that. Many have been extremely courageous. Our, 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 our campaign is against the corruption of Vladimir Putin and the way that he has controlled this country. He'll start a war in order to become popular and stay popular, and we need to recognize that it's based upon his corrupt practices. He's the wealthiest, reported to be the wealthiest person in Europe, and he's been a public servant all of his life. So we need to deal with these fundamental issues if we're going to protect our democracy and the democracy of our allies around the world. Thank you for being here to learn more. Part of this is a better informed constituency, better informed citizenry on the risks that we have to our democracy.
Senator Cardin, thank you so much. And thank you, of course, uh, to everyone for coming out this morning, right? It's uh, you know, a nice late subject uh, to start your November <laughs> off with. Uh, but it's, it's incredibly well-timed, right, this conversation. And I want to start right where, where you began, which is how global is the threat? You talked about 27 different countries uh, in this report that Russia has been active in. Uh, one thing that's been striking to me is this didn't just start, obviously, in the 2016 election, even though many people here in the United States are focusing on this. Uh, you know, the people I knew in Russia circles, right, they were, I, I, I used to say they were like blinking red, right? The light was going off and they were sort of trying to get attention because this was happening uh, in countries next to Russia for quite some time in Eastern Europe, in Central Europe. What, do you think there were signals along the way? Do you have a, a, a starting point for this? Well, you, you, first of all, the 2016 engagement of Russia in our election, I think Russia was caught off guard as to why we thought it was so surprising. I mean, they've been involved in this for, for – this is not the first election they've been involved with. Uh, they've been uh, in, engaged in misinformation and planning information uh, in the United States and globally for a long period of time. This has been a conscientious effort. Uh, admittedly, it was Mr. Putin, when he rised uh, the power, that really took this to a level that we had never seen before. Yes, in the United States, primary target, Europe. Primary targets are the former republics of the Soviet Union and those countries that were under the control of the Soviet Union. That, that was, that's their primary target. Their secondary targets are Europe, and we are a third target and a great prize for them to be able to get. So, yes, we saw signs of this well before the 2016 elections. Uh, we were naive about it, and we, we saw Russia putting a lot of money into RT and to Sputnik and to other news medias, and we saw, we looked at their news, we thought it was pretty clever. We didn't recognize their uh, involvement in social media. That, I think, caught us somewhat by surprise, and we're now seeing the numbers. Uh, at least I was not aware of how widespread uh, their influence was on social media. Uh, we learned during the 2016 campaign that they have developed ways in which they can make fake news look real and get it uh, uh, circulated at a, a very, very quick level. Um, and we also now learning through what is happening with the investigations that they use American talent and American assets the best that they can to, to further these goals. Some of this is innocent contacts by Americans. Other is just greed and by Americans trying to profit wherever they can, not recognizing the damage they're doing to our country. But there has been certainly complicity by, by Americans, as there have been in other parts of the world, against the interests of their own country. Well, it's interesting you raise this point about we're just learning now, obviously, some of this playbook, even though it's been used in other countries. Uh, I interviewed Jim Clapper, the former director of national intelligence, who was uh, under President Obama, and he said that was the big new revelation over the last few months is the extent uh, of the social media use and manipulation. But you raise this point that there have been some actions taken that, that you're putting together a fund, for example, that would work with European allies and partners on this. Are there concrete things that we are not yet doing that we didn't do before that we should be doing? For example, you mentioned the countries of the former Soviet Union. Several of them are now NATO members, members of the European Union in the Baltic states, for example. Uh, how do we share information right now? Are there concrete things that we could be doing that we haven't yet done? Uh, and are there tools that people have found that are effective in your view? Right. Uh, we're certainly not at the level we need to be in sharing information among our allies. I've talked to many of our European friends as to how well prepared they are uh, in regards to, first, the cyber activities of, of not just Russia, by the way. There are other countries that are actively engaged in misinformation and using cyber information uh, to either compromise individuals or to get information that they can use and spin in a way that they think is useful for their objectives. Uh, we, we have, because of the dangers of cyber directly to our national security and compromising our military or our energy or our banking system, uh, our transportation grid, there's been more cooperation on cybersecurity than on, uh, than on the propaganda issues and the use of, of information against our democratic institutions. What we're trying to do is use that same model that we've used on cyber cooperation 
to use it on propaganda and how attacks are being made, protection of our free election systems. Europe is very concerned about the free election system. They're working with us on that. Actual voting systems, you mean? Well, the, yes. I mean, they could manipulate actual. It, in the United States, it's difficult because of the way we control elections are so local that it's, it, it really is extremely complicated to figure out how you can. But recognize, as we saw in some of the work in the 2016 elections, Russia was hiring American experts who knew where the vulnerabilities were to change an election result, of what precincts are the most important, what communities are the most important. They hired those type of experts in the United States in order to target their social media to those critical spots. It doesn't take a lot for Russia to figure out, well, if we can manipulate, we don't have to manipulate every voting booth. If we can manipulate a, a, a fraction, we can affect the outcome of elections, or we can affect the outcome of a Senate race, or we can affect an outcome of a House race. So yes, we are worried that they will directly get involved in trying to manipulate election results. Uh, it, every country is a little bit different. The integrity of the election system is something that we spend a lot of time on, so I, I, I want to tell you we are taking uh, uh, precautions. We do know we've been hacked. We know how many state systems have been hacked. That's, we know that. Uh, so we are trying to shore up the, the specific uh, elements of a democratic system, but it's the broader issues on the use of social media, the use of misinformation, disinformation, the uh, uh, propaganda, the amount of resources Russia puts into RT and Sputnik and those types of issues versus what we do, we being the, 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 our Western alliance, uh, and we are nowhere near where they are. So this uh, appropriation, and uh, I'm going to give the appropriators credit because they started before even the authorization was passed, putting money in the budget, uh, is now, it was released by the Trump administration, they're now implementing it, is to develop a NATO-type strategy among our allies to recognize that we're under attack and how can we protect us against uh, disinformation. No, it's, in, you, it's interesting you use this phrase, under attack. I wanted to ask you, what is the uh, sort of framework in which you see this problem? Some people have given it almost a, a military uh, connotation, right? I think it was former Vice President Dick Cheney said something like this is akin to an act of war. Many people have looked at um, General Gerasimov's article uh, of a few years back in Russia and promoting the idea of this as a tool and a part of a new kind of hybrid warfare. Other people say, listen, this has been around uh, you know, long before there was Facebook or Twitter. Uh, this was part of the Soviet Union's playbook in right. Eastern Europe. How do you personally view it? Do you think it's uh, war is the right metaphor here? You're falling into Russia's trap. That, that's Russia is spending money in this country to convince us that this is nothing more than what's been done through, since the beginning of time. It's a conscientious effort to say we all do this. So why is America getting upset? And we're falling trapped to it because mm -hmm. we're given legitimacy to this. I mean, the most absurd example I could give you of this information, uh, Rob mentioned the Magnitsky Law that we passed. Mm -hmm. The facts of Magnitsky are well established and known. These are facts. Russia's hired American PR firms to discredit Sergei Magnitsky. And we see this on social media all the time. So we're now getting, is there two stories to Magnitsky? No, there's not two stories to Magnitsky. And there are not two sides to this. This is a, cyber is an attack against our country. When you use cyber in an affirmative way to compromise our democratic free election system, that's an attack against an America. So I'm guessing you're a yes then on the uh, act of war. <laughs> it's an act of war. It well, is an act of war. And you know, it, that's a very good example that you brought up about Sergei Magnitsky. Not only uh, do you have the sort of fake news aspect or the, the propaganda aspect, but you actually now, I believe they went into a, a courtroom in Russia uh, just the other day, and they're now claiming that not only was Sergei Magnitsky not killed by the Russian authorities uh, in jail in Moscow, but that actually somehow uh, his employer, Bill Browder, killed from him. thousands of miles away, killed, killed him, him right. while he was in the Russian jail. Yeah, it, 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 the absurdity of what they say, but uh, 
you know, we say that this is ridiculous. Nobody's going to believe it. But it does discredit. This is their this is their M.O. This is what they do. And the Magnitsky uh, trademark has gotten such an important global uh, point. Russia is spending a great deal of resources to discredit the individual himself. And, of course, Bill Browder, they're trying to discredit him. As soon as Canada passed the global Magnitsky law, Russia for the fifth time put Browder on the uh, Interpol list. Um, and it caused a little bit of commotion for a few days. So, and that, but, but that story will be in the Internet now forever, that, uh, that Bill Browdard was, is an international criminal. We, he was even on the Interpol list. How can you, that's a fact. He's on the Interpol list. Isn't he a criminal? So that's how they operate. And it, no, no, nothing is too small, and their objectives are very large for Russia and other international players to use disinformation, but their principal objective, and they did this in our elections, is to say everybody does it. Everybody does it. So they get some people disgusted and they don't participate. And uh, we see this playing out in American politics, not that we are facilitating the Russians intentionally, I'm not suggesting that at all, but we see this play out in American politics where we reinforce this message and therefore what is real news and what is fake news? The public's starting to wonder whether anything is real. And therefore, they take fake news and they take real news and they evaluate it the same. That's frightening. Have you seen examples in your work on the Foreign Relations Committee of uh, other countries learning lessons from this uh, very sophisticated campaign by the Russians? around the world, not just here in the United States. Are you seeing other countries, other authoritarian governments that uh, are learning these lessons and applying them? Oh, oh absolutely. We, we see, you know, propaganda's been around for a long time. Russia's taken it to a different level, particularly the use of social media. They are well ahead of any other country. But, yes, yeah, so we, we see uh, other authoritarian countries that put out information that is just blatantly false, and they, they do it to... You also see them using other tactics that Russia has used for maintaining popular support in a totalitarian government or an authoritarian government. Uh, you know, we, we've seen some of this in Venezuela. We've seen some of this in uh, in uh, uh, in China. We see, uh, we've we have, uh, of course, in a democratic country, the Philippines. We've seen that employed by Mr. President Duterte saying that the numbers are are you put out. These are the authoritative numbers, X number. And we know that the real numbers are much, much higher than the numbers he put out. And you have an expert here who can talk more about the Philippines. So, yes, we see this being played out in other countries. Well, so let's go back to tools for a second. As you think about it as a, as a legislator, uh, you know, you, you mentioned your work on sanctions and you're the you know, co-author with Senator McCain of the Magnitsky Act. We've imposed a series of sanctions also uh, on Russia since the takeover of Crimea and the invasion of eastern Ukraine. Do you think sanctions can help address issues like this? Are there more effective tools? Uh, obviously, one of the big challenges in dealing with this area is that we have uh, freedom of speech here and we have a First Amendment, which uh, inevitably mm -hmm. makes it an even more difficult legislative matter. So, Susan, i got to correct you. Congress passed new sanctions against well, Russia. we haven't implemented them. <laughs> the president has not implemented those new sa sanctions. He missed the first deadline on giving us information. He has now given that to us. The, the next deadlines occur early next year that we'll be watching pretty carefully to see whether these mandatory sanctions are in fact carried out as Congress intended. Now, there is certain discretion that the administration has in definitions. Uh, Congress is pretty clear as to what we intended. Uh, there is going to be strong oversight. I've had uh, numerous discussions with the Trump administration, and I hear the right things from the people who are implementing the statutes, but Senator McCain and I intend to be very much uh, active in making sure they are carried out. Uh, Mr. Putin really despises sanctions. He despises them. He hates the Magnitsky Law. He despises the sanctions that Europe and the United States imposed against him for what happened in Ukraine. And uh, he's very offended by the two pieces of property that have been taken away from him in the United States. One happens to be in Maryland. 
So these are really important issues. They may not seem to be much, but they really are. So if we take this to the next level, which is what Congress mandated, uh, it will get Russia's attention. And I think it will affect their conduct. They'll take us to as far as we'll let them take us. Take, they'll take that. They'll, they will not, in my view, invade a NATO country because they are concerned that we will live up to our treaty commitments and respond. Ukraine's not a NATO country. Moldova's not NATO. Georgia's not NATO. Why are Russian troops there? Because they can be there. So we've got to make it clear that we are going to be stand up against these attacks on the United States. Do you think, uh, do you see a big difference between how China, for example, uses uh, cyber tools or you know, information warfare yes. uh, from the Russian campaign? Yes. Yeah, so, so China is as active, it's not more active than Russia on cyber. They, they're extremely active. They use it for a different purpose. They're not, they're not as globally interested as Russia. Russia has global intentions as far as restoring the prestige of the, the Russian Republic. China is more strategic. They just like to steal. You know, they want a competitive advantage for their industries. They, want, they, 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 they look at ways that they can help their own country uh, and their system show their citizens that they're doing well. So it it's really is a different philosophy in China. It's not that it isn't dangerous. It is dangerous. But it is much more strategic to China's emerging interests as a major economic power. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, they'll use it at times if they're concerned about security. We saw that on maritime security issues are clearly an issue that's on their mind. And that's causing a major security issue. And they're certainly worried about North Korea, as we are worried about North Korea. So they'll use it in some of that aspect for security, but most of it's economic. Well, it's interesting you brought up North Korea. Uh, you know, who was I interviewed? I think it was Dennis Blair a, a month or so ago, and he he made the point that uh, North Korea has really punched above its weight when it comes to uh, hacking and uh, cyber intrusions, and that you wouldn't think that a small, isolated country that uh, you know isn't even connected to the internet for the vast majority of its citizens would uh, have this as one of their sort of asymmetric strengths, but that they were quite strong in this. Have you seen an escalation in hacking from North Korea at the same time that there's been this escalation in the public yeah. warlords? Well, North Korea, you, you, they, they, when you don't use your resources to feed your people, it gives you resources to use them for other purposes. Uh, they're, they're extremely oppressive against their, their citizens. It's the, uh, it, we believe they're number one in the world in human rights violations. So it's, and there's a lot of candidates out there. So, uh, but North Korea is totally focused on regime, preserving its regime. They see their nuclear program as their best way of getting there, so they spend a lot of effort on their nuclear programs. Most of their cyber activities are centered around that objective. There's, there's, uh, there's different aspects to that. But they're, again, they're not like Russia that has these global desires for greater influence. North Korea is trying to preserve a regime and are using their cyber attacks for getting revenues, working with criminal elements, things like that, in order to further their uh, self-preservation. So tell us, uh, looking ahead in your crystal ball, uh, we know you can see into it uh, clearly, is there anything that stops this, this cycle of escalation, uh, especially when you don't really see a, a, a strong response at this point from the United States or, or from other countries? Yeah. When it doesn't work. And it won't work if the public's better informed, which brings us back to where we are right now at the museum and, and the freedom of the press and investigative reporting and all those issues. We have to get, have a better informed constituency, not just the United States, but globally. And they're better prepared so that they can sort out what is real and what is fake. And I, I would never diminish the intelligence of the, of the people of this country and the world. They get it. They need to understand the tactics that are being deployed. They can sort through it. Once that happens, democracy will prevail. And these tactics won't work. So yes, I think there is an end when it, when it doesn't work power in this country is with the people. You know, I have to say, as a journalist, it's delightful that you're so optimistic, uh, in a way, about the, the power of our profession. Because I will tell you that in some ways, uh, you know, I've come out of 2016 
somewhat uh, concerned about, you know, our religion always was basically transparency. Uh, you know, right. sunlight is the best disinfectant. Uh, but in many ways, right, uh, fact checking, this has been a golden age for it. We have more fact checkers working uh, at uh, Western institutions here in the United States, but, but in Europe as well than ever before, right? Uh, you have better access to facts and information and, and to real news along with fake news than ever before. The accountability question is, is really where it comes to. So give me some more optimism here. Uh, <laughs> well, first of all, you know, the, the, the news profession has changed so dramatically, uh, probably changed since yesterday to today. I mean, it's changing so quickly. Uh, and when I go out and I speak to groups all the time, one thing I give President Trump a lot of credit for, he's been extremely successful in us. And I thank him for this, of energizing the public. They really want to get engaged in the political process more than ever before. Uh, so when they ask how, I tell them first, and I hope I'm not offending people in this room, turn off the cable news for a couple of days every week and take a break, <laughs> you know, because it's distracting you. Stay focused on the issues you care about. So if your passion is to protect America's values on the refugee population, the migrants, the DACA registrants, the temporary protective status. Stay focused on that issue. Don't let the indictments yesterday distract you from what you're trying to get done, because that's going to be the story for the next couple of days, and now the next day will be President Trump saying that he had the largest crowd ever in in Asia that anybody's ever had in the history of mankind. And that's going to be the news for two days because that's what's going to be the cable. So stay away from that. Stay away from that. Stay focused on the issues. And yes, I think we all have responsibility to get the facts. On the refugee immigrant, the facts are pretty clear. And we've got to get that information out. There's been a lot of misinformation out. We know the, the direct effort that was done in Germany in setting up Lisa the immigrant, uh, rape by an immigrant, which was a false story in order to get the anti-immigrant. You've you got to counter that. So you've got to get the facts out. And, uh, but I do think that it, it, there's a lot of people out there who are on your side. You've got to empower them by making sure they don't get distracted uh, and they get the real facts so that they can work. Uh, and, uh, and and use the power of the people. Well, I know we're almost out of time, so I guess my, my final question to you is, Is there are there examples of other countries or other institutions that you think are getting it right or that are adopting policy choices we might look to adopt here? You know, a lot of people talked about Estonia, for example, yes. or the Germans. Well, Estonia is very strong, doing a great job on, on cybersecurity. We're doing a great job on cybersecurity. I was at the the Cybersecurity uh, Center of Excellence in Montgomery County, Maryland. They're doing a fabulous job in my own state of Maryland. So there's some good things that are being done, uh, and we got to share those, those best practices. Uh, I think that is uh, e extremely important. Uh, I, I guess I would just say that um, the challenge, I think, and where we really need to understand, you mentioned the First Amendment. We're all very sensitive about the First Amendment. But we really need to understand the responsibilities of, of social media. And we're having hearings on the Hill dealing with the social media, the, the infiltration by Russia into what they did. I think that's going to be the area where we can share best practices. Our technology firms here really are extremely capable. We need them to give us the answer to this problem that doesn't impede technology but protects us and our democratic institutions. And I guess, the, to me, it's taking the innovative technology that we have and the people behind it in the United States and applying it to our national security of our democratic institutions, working with our European allies with the monies that we already made available to develop new standards for how to deal with this threat. And yes, I see that coming from the United States of America. I think we can do it. Well, it seems like you have a lot of work to do up there on Capitol Hill, Senator. <laughs> well, thank you. I know we're, we're all very grateful to you for uh, sharing your time with us this morning, especially on such a you know, timely subject. So uh, we appreciate that. And as a journalist, I have to say, I thank you uh, for your very optimistic view of our profession. Well, and I, 
And my only regret is I have to go back to the Hill now. So thank you all very much. <laughs> Now I think we're going to uh, jump right into our next panel. So I'd love to invite the uh, the panelists to come up and join us. Yeah, thank you. Come. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. Yeah, sit, sit, sit here. Come. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Speaking of social media, we are <laughs> live in the Philippines this morning, folks. Live in the Philippines. Love Philippines. Well, this is really, this is a treat, I have to say. Uh, for me, I've been looking forward uh, to having this conversation all week because I want to hear what everybody has to say. But these are, uh, as was mentioned, our three honorees. And I think you can all find out more information uh, in your... My schedule here, but let me go ahead and introduce. I'm looking to see if I have the description. So, our panelists today have been brought here really literally from around the world, and they represent a lot of the front lines uh, that Senator Cardin was talking about, right? So, we can almost jump right in. I'll just introduce everybody as, uh, as we get right into it. Uh, first of all, right here we have uh, Maria Ressa representing her organization, Rappler in the Philippines, uh, and she, she can literally uh, discuss with us what it is like to be a woman on the front lines of uh, uh, the disinformation uh, fight with President Duterte. Uh, so thank you so much, Maria, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, no, it's wonderful. Congratulations. Uh, and then another front in the uh, global war, we already talked a little bit about Ukraine this morning. Uh, we have Margot Gontar here who is uh, one of the founders, is that right, of the organization StopFake.org in Ukraine. Uh, and what's amazing is that this is an organization that started uh, really right in 2014. Uh, so, right. you know, you've seen the whole evolution in some ways uh, of how Russia operates uh, in what it considers to be a, a, a battlefield, uh, the cyber battlefield in Ukraine as part of the actual Battlefield. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you Margaret. for having me. Uh, no, it's delightful. And Phil Howard uh, here from the Oxford Internet Institute, I think, is really helping to shape all of our perceptions about how this works, not just in one individual country. Uh, and your group has been doing really cutting-edge research, uh, not only about individual case studies, but uh, about basically this rapidly developing new field of, of computational uh, uh, disinformation. I guess that's the uh, very fancy Oxford name for it. <laughs> well, thank you so much uh, for joining us, Phil. Uh, and of course, we are going to bring in the audience uh, as well, and I'm looking forward to hearing some of the very well-informed questions I know we'll get. But let's let's go ahead and start with you. Uh, it, you heard the senator's remarks, and obviously he's working to try to figure out how does the United States fit into this global context uh, in many ways of... Uh, individual countries and individual actors figuring out how to use these tools that we have uh, for not just for information but for disinformation. What can you tell us about how quickly this environment has shifted? I mean, one thing I think is that many Americans are saying, wow, this, you know, where did this come from? What's your timeline though? What's your chronology? You, <laughs> you're laughing because you're going to say we've been living with this for more than uh, two well, years. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, I, I certainly agree. It's, it's been around for several years. We also started in 2014 um, looking at this phenomenon. I was living in Budapest at the time. And um, as you, many of you will remember, the summer of 2014 was when the Malaysian Airlines flight was shot down over Ukraine. And I watched my Hungarian friends get multiple conflicting stories about what had gone on. There were stories that uh, the Americans had shot it down. There were stories that uh, Ukrainian democracy advocates had shot it down because they thought Putin was on the plane. Uh, they, there was a story, my favorite, was a story about a lost World War II tank that had been stuck in the forests of Ukraine and had come out and made the mistake of shooting down an airplane. 
and these <laughs> with some really old soldiers. Some very old soldiers <laughs> that were confused and 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 took aim uh, and with uh, yeah with their with their tanks shot the plane down. And so it was amazing to see how my Hungarian friends were processing this because they knew that the origins of the story were with Russia, but processing it was part distracting everyone was part of the strategy. Seeding these multiple conflicting, often ridiculous stories was the goal. The communication strategy was not about giving the opponents one message to respond to, but four or five different ones so that opponents couldn't even agree on, on what the terms of response would be. And the big surprise for us in the research we started that summer 14, in the summer 2014, the big surprise about, for us was watching this communication strategy move from being one that dictators used in their country to one that authoritarian regimes used to target voters in other countries, and then to being a strategy that political leaders in democracies also copy. Right? So the strategy of generating fake news is now a normal part of party competition in several democracies. And so over the last few years, there's been that, that shift in strategy, and social media has been a very important part of, of making it possible to see multiple conflicting stories over uh, our own trusted networks of family and friends. I think that's the, the, secret, that's the secret sauce to making the delivery so successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot more to come back to in there, but that is, that is a great sort of foundational story. Uh, so you were in Ukraine, uh, obviously, when that happened, right? Where, where were you when the, the Malaysia plane was shot down? It was actually two days before my birthday. Not exactly a great stance to study from. Yeah, I was in Kiev, I was in Ukraine. And uh, well, to me, it was in a way what we've seen afterwards is like a turning point for a lot of mainstream media all over the world. I mean, like before it, we still needed to like tell more what is it, why it is dangerous and what actually can be happening. But after the strategy, all the, the first pages of a lot of news media were pretty concrete about stating like who can be behind it and what they think about Putin himself. Mm -hmm. So on this way, it is like a black swan, like it, it's even had this black swan effect. So, and, um, and yeah, we were fighting uh, starting from March with the, all the propaganda and everything. And we will be doing, we will be seeing how Russian military forces are actually moving around and how they support uh, those um, was that Metal the, units. Was that the specific origin of stopfake.org, the uh, Russian denial of their military being in Crimea? Well, Remember we launched... the little green men? Yeah, we launched actually day after a day, like on the 2nd of March, so it was day after all news were with this sign that Russia declared a war against Ukraine, which uh, officially it did not. They just said they need to protect Russian-speaking population, like Russian-speaking people in Crimea. It was actually... The starting point of their invasion was actually the fake news because it all was all over the place that two Russians were killed in Crimea. That's why they need to protect them. The thing is that they say it appeared to be fake, but they never withdrew the decision um, that they can do this. And then Green Man, again, were not with no insignia, but later Putin himself admitted um, it's in, in a film. So starting point was exactly for our project uh, that we've seen how many, uh, how much this information is disinformation is in there and that it might be hard for general public who does not have time on their hands and maybe expertise to actually get to know because the thing is we've done this polls in ukraine that uh, a lot of people the majority actually feels that there is a danger and a threat of russian disinformation but the other thing that majority again feels that they have the gut feeling to actually get the idea what is fake with no probable expertise, just because they will feel it. But the thing is, if you can feel it, it's a bad fake story, because usually it's more complicated than that. And it can actually be really hard to, to get the idea, and you will still advertise the fake narrative while you try to debunk it. Right, well, I think that goes back to my question to the senator, right, about uh, how is it possible that we can be living on the one hand in what is art, inarguably the golden age of fact-checking, of uh, access to information, good information, uh, ability right away to get to real facts, uh, and yet that that could coexist with uh, a golden age for disinformation. 
uh, it's it, it's paradoxical, but I think you know that's that's something that you are both experiencing. I want to come back to you about what you've learned in in undertaking this since 2014. But Maria, why did you start Rapper? What is your sort of foundation story? Social media. Really, you know, at the core of it is that social media spreads exponentially. And so we caught the positive wave. So uh, uh, Rappler is five and a half years old. In 2012, we grew 100 to 300 percent based on that crest of social media. But in 2016, we also watched social media destroy the democracy that, that we had seen. And, you know, in a quick answer to the question that you, you just posed is, you know, when, when you have this exponential sea of information and the old ways of determining fact from fiction are gone, it hasn't, you know, um, political, your credibility doesn't necessarily translate online. You're the same as any, any person online. We're the same. Journalists who have been fighting for decades, we would be the same. And that, we celebrated that at the beginning. But now, uh, how do we separate fact from fiction? when you're separated from the real world. So that our goal now is to try to define that, to try to harness it, to try to stop anger and hatred. And uh, you know, we don't have concrete links. I mean, on Rappler, I have seen links from Russia. We, at the same way, we've seen links from China. But in the Philippines, the platform where you should see all of this and the data is there, I'm certain of it, is Facebook. Because in the Philippines, and that's, I think, the one thing we haven't mentioned, are the tech platforms yeah. where all of this travels, right? Uh, in the Philippines, we spend, of any country in the world, uh, we spend the most online. And that's from We Are Social. Yeah. So you're year. saying that, but Facebook doesn't give you the data? No. Right. Like, you, you know, again, if we say we want transparency, I think that's the first step. We don't want transparency just from governments. Right. We want transparency from platforms. Mm -hmm. And I think the other part of the Philippines is that 97% of Filipinos on the internet, you're talking about roughly 58 million Filipinos, 97% are on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So Facebook is our public space. Right. If if Americans are, I think it's roughly forty four percent. get it's your certainly news from. Lower than that. Yeah. We are rough almost everyone, and our we're a very young population. Twenty three years old is the median age. Let me ask you though. So, do you agree with this war metaphor? Do you believe that this is a, a form of information warfare? And in in some ways, what you're describing is not an external threat as much. Uh, there are external people involved, but that your democracy somehow was threatened from within. It's both. I don't think this is homegrown. The tactics are not homegrown. We've seen, certainly seen it in other countries around the world. But what we've seen now is the, a campaign. So our very, very first social media president is as mayor, then Mayor Rodrigo Duterte. Uh, some people call him the Trump of the East. Some people call Trump the Duterte of the East, <laughs> <laughs> right? Depends well, on where you're sitting from. First, right? Right? <laughs> We're six months ahead of the United yeah. States, so we could be a cautionary tale. But what, what you've seen <laughs> is state-sponsored online hate. Mm -hmm. So online state-sponsored hate. And I think uh, that's one of the things. If, if uh, you're not certain where it's coming from, if you're being manipulated, if it is meant to stifle dissent and to shape a narrative, um, why? We saw it, so it's funny, he got elected in May 2016, but the weaponization of social media didn't actually begin until after July. It slightly coincided with the beginning of the drug war. Uh, you know, it's no secret, the Philippines has been uh, criticized by every human rights group uh, for the thousands of people who have died in the drug war beginning July of 2016. And what's happened since then is anytime anyone on Facebook questions the extrajudicial killings, they get bashed. So the first people who felt it were human rights activists, people who were questioning the thousands of people who were dying. Every night we would get, we would see at least eight people dying every night at the beginning of this drug war. Um, then after that, the next targets were the journalists. and. Um, after Rappler came out with a social media propaganda series where we actually gave the data. You know, here it is, 26 fake accounts, a sock puppet network of 26 fake accounts can ripple to 3 million others. We counted that manually for three months because we didn't trust the tech that much until after the journalists went through it. And then we automated the scraping of the data. 
the data is there, we've given it to Facebook. And I think part of my great frustration now is that technology really has to jump in. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not within our hands. The journalists are no longer the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers are the tech companies, whether they take it or not. Well, I want to ask everybody this, but just quickly, do you uh, worry as a journalist uh, that, uh, you know, when we say technology is a, is is got to provide us those solutions, that we're going to be getting into regulating speech? Do they have the capability to address this without impinging on people's rights uh, to uh, offer free speech, including speech that we disagree with? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is the crux of it, right? And I think that the, the question, the challenge uh, is to define the line when freedom of expression becomes inciting to violence or inciting to hate. But from my experience, what I've seen is given, it's been almost two years that I've lived through this. And I think at one point I was getting 90 hate messages per hour. Per you know, hour. I, per hour for a month, for about a month. I mean, I've been from a war zone. From people? From bots? From Very hard to tell right now. Um, there definitely are bots on Twitter, and there are definitely automated alerts on Facebook. But to, to get this, it's easier to be a war zone correspondent than to be online now in the Philippines because of the frequency of attacks. And the attacks are psychological now, and the hard part is you don't know when it transfers from the virtual to the real world. Mm -hmm. right. So given all of this, and given that we have given the data to the people who have the data, you know, the only thing I would say is that, at best, it's an abdication of responsibility for the tech platform. At worst, it's a, a kind of complicity mm -hmm. with the state, uh, because any business needs the state to operate. And which business will actually put public good and press freedom issues and human rights ahead of business? That's the dilemma for them. So, Phil, what does your research across countries tell us about exactly this issue of, first of all, uh, responsibility of the tech platforms, and how much has it become now new capabilities that are enabling people to do this beyond just uh, you know a few people at a time? Mm -hmm. I, I certainly agree that in most other countries, Facebook is essentially a monopoly publisher of mm -hmm. news. Right, they have that. Stature and they play a functionally they put, play a publishing role um, for, for many political systems. And there's a very important gender component to this in that many of the we've seen over multiple countries now mm -hmm. the, um, the some of the most unfortunately the most successful campaigns are those that target prominent female politicians, mm -hmm. prominent feminist intellectuals, female journalists. They're, um, th this kind of campaigning is particularly um, driven successful at driving female voices out of public culture in multiple countries. I think um, that the moment for industry self-regulation has passed. So we're at, we're at a moment where some kind of gentle public policy oversight is needed. The nature of that is going to vary a lot from country to country. The European Union is likely to regulate first before mm -hmm. anything happens in, in, certainly in, the, in the United States. So. So the, the task for us becomes trying to make sure that they don't over-regulate, right? So the technology platforms on their own haven't done enough to help public life. Some gentle nudges from public policy, probably that involve just enforcing the rules that we already expect our media providers to, to live by, right? Probably just enforcing those the rules. have been rule. established, haven't they? Yeah. We live by them. Some of those norms, uh, filing ads with central uh, government officials, you know, uh, making sure that the ads declare who paid for them. Right. Some of these things are basic, basic rules for, for political systems and, and making sure that social media platforms behave as media firms uh, is probably the way, part of the way forward. Mm -hmm. hey, let me follow up on this gender uh, uh, targeting, the gender specific targeting. Uh, do you, it seems like there's a lot of head nodding here that everybody agrees <laughs> with this. Now, women, of course, are already uh, a minority in public life uh, here in the United States as well uh, as around the world. Uh, and so is this targeting a vulnerable minority population, in effect, uh, in the public space? Or is there something specific you found uh, that, it, that it is more effective against women? I'm happy to defer to the two of you who may um, to answer that. I would just offer that there are... Um, that the goal of these campaigns is often to just push 
push someone offline to prevent right. them from doing their, their to work. Silence on Twitter, silence to silence them. To silence them. And you know, a growing number of civil society groups um, and journalists now have to face this choice of responding aggressively or withdrawing. So this is your point, that by responding sometimes to disinformation, you elevate it or give it a platform, which of course the people who are producing it know very well. Yeah, but uh, well, basically you still need to go through these key points to decide whether we react or not. And I think like government officials sometimes do this as well. I mean, like how far it goes, uh, like how many people actually seen the fake news and how many people might see it more if you refute it. But not reacting at all is not the case if we're speaking about fake information. For example, because social media that was mentioned now, that it's, we've seen how it may appear in social media and then if no reaction happens, uh, media can pick up it and then elevate it. And basically the reason for this will be precisely that it appeared in social media. They kind of have the argument, but way pe people are saying about this. So that's why there might be the need to jump in right away because a part of journalists, there are also activists who would love to sh spread the, the truthful content, but they cannot be be before it's being refuted. So they also wait for this uh, refutation of fake appears so they can actually fight the trolls or fight the, those who, who sincerely believe in sort of conspiracy theories. Uh, so just quickly, in Ukraine, since you've been going in 2014, uh, how much have you learned that there is a connection between uh, the, the online war, the cyber information war, and the, the physical uh, war, and, and, and also violence against journalists? We talked about that. Uh, but, uh, you know, does this exist purely in the virtual space? Uh, how much do you feel that it's just a part of a broader campaign of violence? Well, thank you for this. And I actually feel that, um, well, we are now, I think, it was mentioned before, uh, but we are now in a situation when there is no like distinction between the information and like physical action on the war field. So basically, we, information is being weaponized and it all starts with information, and information continues uh, as uh, the, the, the war action might, might, might go further. So that's why, yes, it's definitely, it's definitely influencing, and we've definitely seen uh, how the, the impacts of this, because um, it all starts with winning the hearts and minds of people, and then they can come to action. So basically, some of it that you can, could have seen in Crimea and in Eastern Ukraine being also a part of these campaigns as well. Do you feel that you and your team are under uh, actual threat, physical threat? I actually don't know. This is what uh, Maria mentioned. This is exactly the thing. I also received the hate messages about like dying in my own blood or something like this. But you never know like how much it is just like a hateful comment that someone did out of rage or mm -hmm. because being paid for and when they will know, I don't know, do something more. So that's, I think, the, the main reason behind the threat things. Being under attack in terms of technical hacking or something, yes, we had them, I think three major ones, and also we have something like it whenever some event happening, basically something connected, I don't know, Netherlands is a random, so any particular event, you can see uh, more fakes coming and more like attacks coming when this happening. The other thing that we have great AT team and we basically managed to deal with that. So tell me about the connection that you see between, uh, you know, the physical world and this uh, sort of hate and misinformation filled online world. Where do I begin? I, I'm just going to pick up some of the threads okay, that you, you brought out, right? First is, you know, if, if a lie is told 10 times, truth can catch up. But if a lie is told a million times, it's truth. And I think that's, that's the problem that we have. I don't think we cannot not respond. Because, and, and we've tried. In two years, we've tried everything from responding to everything to not responding to anything. And what we've found is at least if you respond, your, your response is out there. And and people can find it, but they have to find it because it depends on the algorithm growth. This disinformation is not just meant to make you click once on fake news, it's meant to game the algorithm so that they, they're, they're, this kind of disinformation crops up more on the newsfeed. Um, so the first is that, you cannot not respond. Now, 
if you take it as it, it individually, right? If I were to have responded to 90 hate messages per hour, 90 hate messages per hour, that would mean in a 24 hour day, <laughs> it would be 6,500 hours. I don't have enough time to do that. And why should the journalist be the one to have to police that platform? That's the second part. And then I think the third part is, I've been so very patient because it was how we grew, mm -hmm. you know? And it is amazing the things that you could do with this exponential growth of technology, disaster risk reduction, fighting corruption, getting a message out, starting a new group. But what we've seen, and, and that you've documented this in the computational propaganda reports, in France, uh, for their elections, because of the US elections. So first, the Phil we actually gave that data in August of 2016. Mm. And I actually said, you know, this could impact US elections. And then I was asked for the data again after the US elections, mm -hmm. after President Trump won. Um, we're an outpost. <laughs> the French elections, because of the US elections, mm -hmm. Uh, 30,000 fake accounts were taken down. If 26 fake accounts can reach 3 million, how many can 30,000 fake accounts take down? And then after, ye just yesterday, just this week, right, because of the hearings here in DC, all of a sudden we're told that almost 44% of Americans were reached by disinformation. Right. You need to push to get this stuff. The data is there. Action needs to be taken. The only groups that can take action are the tech companies. Okay, so there's so much to unpack here. Phil, how much are you seeing uh, lessons learned spread around, uh, you know, and is this solely the province really at, at, at the most voluminous level of state actors right now? Uh, you know, how much is it going to be a tool that uh, many others can use? What, what can you tell us about uh, the ways in which people are learning from Russia's disinformation campaign? I think, I think every election that has passed since perhaps November 2016, Facebook has done more and more, Twitter has done more and more to, to, try, to um, uh, try to prevent electoral interference. Um, I think different governments are trying different strategies. Uh, among the strategies people talk about, that these aren't my favorites, but these are just the ones people talk about, um, leaving it to industry to identify fake accounts and shut them down. Um, other policymakers talk about algorithmic audits. So we audit video gambling machines, we audit uh, financial transfer algorithms. Uh, perhaps we should audit Facebook's news algorithms to help understand what goes on in a way that doesn't violate their IP. But we have systems for algorithmic audits. We could audit Facebook. Um, there are proposals to encourage um, to not so much make Facebook a censor, but to put out more good speech. So to try to, to counter all of this by promoting news from the credible news organizations. And that's sort of a safe one because it's, it's fairly easy to identify the, the top 50 most credible news organizations. That kind of list is easy to come up with. It's also fairly easy to identify the worst 50, right? We, we can identify <laughs> those sites. So having social media platforms do a little bit more to make sure that the that the reasoned public speech flows well and the nasty stuff gets stifled that's that's another reasonable policy mm -hmm. policy as well just quickly on that question of whether you've seen other uh, states take up some of these techniques and you know how much do you see the lessons of 2016 uh, being now fed back out into other places well, do, do you mean uh, learning the techniques of manipulation? Or yeah, learning exactly. The, the that's what I mean, learning the techniques of manipulation. Well, that's... Um, uh, that another, seems ahead to me, the, the response. Yeah. Well. That's another part, of, uh, that's another, um, I guess, dark side of the story. W w Russia's been successful at mm -hmm. doing this. And so there are other regimes that are applying the techniques. Um, sometimes it's a matter of the same consultants physically flying off to mm -hmm. other capital cities to advise on how to do this things well, these things well. In the next year alone, uh, there's major elections happening in South Africa and Egypt, uh, Pakistan, right? There's, there's several countries where racial tensions, uh, ethnic religious tensions run high, where the slightest rumor about misconduct can take this from being a, uh, a Facebook exchange to being violence in the streets very quickly. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to Ukraine right now, which uh, in many ways has been sort of a, a laboratory 
uh, for all of this, uh, still is. <laughs> and still is. So, what? Tell us what you've learned. Uh, you know, what was the most response that you got when you tried to fact check uh, something? What? Uh, you know, where did you get the most uh, public response? Well, the I think the first thing answering to your question was actually about what we learned. How it was uh, said before again that. Um, we learned that this is not the goal of uh, disinformation to actually make you believe what they say, uh, but this is actually more to confuse you and to give this skeptical a skepticism that there is no truth. And I actually heard this from youngsters who actually mm -hmm. tell me this in a bold way, like, well, you know, I'm skeptical about truth. I'm like, wait, <laughs> something wrong is here. Because like, how we can be skeptical? But this gives this, you know, intellectual right to intellectual laziness, right, right not to dig in, not to actually check what is happening. This kind of feeling that everyone has their own truth, but this is not a relationship. This is like a factual like context. We either have someone doing something or not. You either know it or not, then investigate. But this is precisely Kremlin stance. I mean, like, I think someone of them told, like, we will never know who actually shot Malaysian yes. airplane. I'm like, <laughs> no, no, yes. actually, we yes, will. You can. <laughs> yeah. This is not how it works. But, um, but again, um, other thing than that, I, to me, it looks like the biggest response and the biggest achievement in a way that we've seen Russian disinformation change strategy. Because for a few first months, starting from March to, to summer, we actually got no response from them at all. It was a weird time because we were like, are we effective or not? I mean, like, what is happening? Mm -hmm. And in summer, we started to see how Russian channels we're using the same patterns like of refuting fakes still to produce fakes. And this is exactly what is important to understand about how it works. This is a virus and they just use um, everything. We have great like achieved so far as humankind and democracy and all of this civilizationally, but just like to make it look like a real thing, but it's still a fake. Like they make it, make it look like a journalism material, but it still might be fake. And now I think the latest we've seen is Russian Foreign Ministry having refuting fakes about Russia on their website, which is surreal. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Russia today having a project called Fake Check, yeah. which refute fakes like they say, for example, of coming from Washington Post. So this is again surreal thing to me, and it's still there. So basically, uh, now we have this uh, weird combination of everything. But the other thing, which also we learned that um, Russia really that did have tailored approach to any concrete country and they turn like push on the weak spots or in the sweet spots basically to influence so I think the most important thing to understand for countering it is to know these weak spots the weak minority questions uh, whatever can be used and the other thing is that Usually, it's obvious in Ukraine because it's undermining everything Ukraine has and Ukraine is. So basically, resources spent on discrediting, like discrediting in part of uh, Ukraine in U EU, discrediting EU as, uh, Ukraine as a state, but in other countries, in the West as well, it's not so obvious. So Kremlin disinformation here, like everywhere, might look like just um, something similar to conspiracy theories but it still doesn't look like exactly coming from, from Russia. Right, exactly. It's not, it's more sophisticated, as you pointed out earlier. It's not, uh, you know, parroting some explicit Kremlin yeah. foreign policy line. It's playing yeah. off of the conversation it's just encouraging, uh, that exists here. It's just encouraging suspicion, hateful, like, narrative, and something of, like, rather closing the border and, like, communication rather than open and be, like, tolerant and this. That's why it might be harder, like in European countries and other, like to pinpoint it just mm -hmm. with a gut feeling. Mm -hmm. Well, this is an excellent point. Uh, I want to bring in our audience in just a second, but uh, Maria, I want to come back to you. Does anything work? Uh, have you uh, found anything that uh, changes, for example, how President Duterte has gone about uh, his campaign, or it, it, would you say he's winning? So what we're seeing right now is, and it was great to hear the senator talk about how journalists can do this, but what if journalists are being replaced? Right. Um, in the Philippines, uh, there's an active state 
move to replace journalists yeah. with blogger propagandists. Mm -hmm. And again, that same kind of you yeah. know shifting everything over, the glass is half empty, half full. We can start there, and then as you move the line further, you're Alice in Wonderland, and a whole chunk of your population believes something completely different from the reality that you have. So the way we dealt with it, last August when we started seeing anger and hate being used on these fissure lines in society, it's obviously a scorched earth policy, right? I studied the Ukraine and Russia. And one of the things we tried to do is you know, to shine the light. We, we talked about that. And then when we did that, I, fig I figured we did the right thing because we were attacked. And then when the journalists were attacked, and then working with the state, when the state then decides to, to take bloggers to the UN General Assembly instead of journalists, uh, these are all signals that ripple through our society. Um, so the quick answer to your question, what works? You just gotta hold the line. You just hold the line and you know the, that spiral of silence that began in July last year lifted this year around uh, no, only about two months ago, you know, and and I think that I'm I'm hoping for the people who are watching from the Philippines. You know, we cannot stay quiet. What happened two months ago? A 14-year-old boy was killed in the drug war, and you know, again, this is an in, a difference between the United States and the Philippines because in the Philippines, social media posts can kill. You know, when when this boy had to. 14-year-old and a 17-year-old boy, almost within within a few weeks of each other, and Filipinos started to wake up a little bit and realize that, you know, we're going to have to say something. Uh, you don't. There's a saying in in Indonesia: the hammer that stands out, the the nail that stands up gets the hammer, mm. and no one wants to get the hammer first. But I think that started, and then when people started to speak, uh, they found they found these, these points. Still very fledgling. Keep in mind, our president, unlike yours, is very popular. Um, Trump is, what, 33%? Our president uh, is at 38%. Um, our, our president is at around 80%, wow. at lowest of 75%. So he's a very popular, very powerful. He has a super majority in Congress. He will appoint 11 of 13 justices of our Supreme Court. This will ripple through our society. No one wants to challenge that. Um, but if we hold the line, um, truth, that's our only, that's our only hope. But right now, it, it sounds naive unless we get help. That's why I'm watching very closely. What are you guys going to do with the tech platforms? No. <laughs> Look, you know what? short, medium, and long term, right? That's right. So that's what I want to ask all of you, and then let's get your questions ready. But that's, that's my final question to everybody. So the United States obviously has long been held itself out as uh, you know, a beacon in the world uh, and embedded human rights and the promotion of democracy uh, as part of its foreign policy. Increasingly, and not just under this administration, that has been called into question, right? Uh, you know, you saw President Obama was not particularly enthusiastic about, uh, you know, the spreading democracy as a part of his foreign policy agenda. Now we are in the midst of what appears to others as as an internal crisis, uh, and questioning our own democratic principles. Uh, you know, every time I imagine there's a fight over fake news here in the United States, you must quake a little bit. So what is the, what is the impact of this internal democratic crisis here in the United States on our ability to be useful internationally uh, on our foreign policy? Well, we'll start with, I mean, it's incredible how much the world has changed in you know, a year and a half. Uh, in the Philippines, with our change in leader, we went from, uh, and President, I'll quote President Duterte, he said, you know, we will pivot from the United States to China and Russia, he said in his visit to Beijing, and that's critical for the South China Sea. In the United States, your shifts are rippling throughout the world, and I guess this is this pivotal moment globally because who will take the leadership, right? Who will, which values win? That's the other part we haven't talked about at all, is when you're, you're young men in society, when people see this much hatred, uh, what does that do for the values of the next generation, for the kids who are there, for the people who are coming in online? Um, what does that mean for America? Back to your question. Uh, I think this is crisis and opportunity. 
um, some countries, I hope in Southeast Asia, it's the 50th year of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Mm -hmm. We keep pushing as journalists to say, hey, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> there's, there is a gap. And that, that's uh, climate change, obviously, huge gap, because we, globally we all fought for something like that. And mm -hmm. the Philippines will be on the losing end of, of the climate change battle. Mm -hmm. um, we hope, we look at the US, again, we hope that you will sort out the issues here because those issues reverberate throughout the world. Mm -hmm. How has uh, our changes affected uh, the fake news conversation in Ukraine? Well, I think it's only straightened, straightened the conversation itself mm -hmm. because it just, what we've seen, uh, what we try to do for the first year and second year is to prove that this is not just a something happening in a country called Ukraine mm -hmm. and which other people who are not interested in the discourse, you know, like a subject in a university. Right. So they at can first just you're trying it. to get attention for it. Yeah, um, but, uh, but those who were understanding what's happening, primarily like countries near us and who knew what Russia is about. So basically they, they stand with us from the very beginning. But uh, others, I, I, I saw this kind of like, mm -hmm. yeah, well, so after all the events around the globe actually started, I see more of understandable eyes when I speak to, to, to whatever I'm speaking to. That's, I think, what it probably mostly done. Mm -hmm. Do you see a big, you must see a big change in the research that you're doing uh, before and after uh, the US became a part of this story? Certainly, and I think one of the big changes ahead of us, and I actually, I genuinely believe the deep threats are ahead of us, not behind us. I think that the- Halloween. <laughs> this is the Halloween scare. Um, I think regardless, regardless of what you think about any particular election outcome right, over the right. last year or two, in a very deep way, this strategy is about undermining, the Russian strategy is about undermining how Western politicians make decisions, mm -hmm. right? To sow dissent about some of the basic things that we have consensus on, like the link between smoking and cancer. Mm -hmm. For 60 years, there's been consensus that smoking causes cancer. But the latest campaigns we're seeing are about introducing doubt. It's not all cancers, and it depends which brand, and it depends on your age <laughs> and gender. And there's a series of issues like that that are geared towards um, getting the public to be unsure and getting politicians to go with their gut instead of going with some of the evidence. That's the deep threat that will undermine democracy, right? We all need good information when we vote. We also need good information when we make public policy decisions. And so I think we're moving from a stage of manipulating particular elections to manipulating public opinion around immigration and how we treat people who cross the border and climate change and science. And there's a bunch of other policy so issues. So issues based. Issue specific. Mm -hmm. um, trying to get Western politicians to use less evidence <laughs> in their decision making is is the next deep threat to democracy. Because politicians were already known for their uh, Rational, <laughs> careful, <you>. cerebral. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's an excellent note to bring in uh, our audience. I'm, I'm looking forward to the questions because I know this is a very distinguished and thoughtful group. Uh, please, I think we have some microphones and please just go ahead when you get up, tell us who you are, where you're from and do make it a question so we can get in as many. Here in the back, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for having me. I'm Lauren Bosma with the Albright Stonebridge Group. Um, this question is for, Mir for Maria. Um, I followed Lenny Robredo very closely, um, being a vocal critic of President Duterte, who happens to be his vice president. Um, and I'm wondering if you've noticed sort of a online smear campaign against her um, and what tactics she's used or her allies have used to combat disinformation. I'll start with the last part of it. It hasn't been effective, the tactic that they've used. Uh, so the first attack against Lenny Robredo really happened, the organized one happened January this year. They used the hashtag Lenny Leaks. We were able to map it and looked at the, the disinformation uh, network that was there. Um, we looked at the main content creators. Those were three accounts that were broken down by demographics. One takes care of the pseudo-intellectual. The other takes care of the middle class. The last takes care of the mass base. The middle class and the mass base bloggers are now working for the government. Um, and what we saw is that same network is the same network that attacked other female politicians, other critical voices. I don't know if you know Senator Lila DeLima, 
She was the head of the Commission on Human Rights and former Justice Secretary. She's now in prison um, on drug-related charges. Uh, the, the sequence, whether it is against politicians or against journalists, uh, there's three, three steps. The first step is to hit credibility of that person, whoever they're attacking, to, to continuously hit it exponentially through the blogger network, um, and then introduce uh, corruption, step one. Step two, uh, tear them apart sexually. The minute you can do that and it takes hold in society, then, then the conversation online moves to really dark places. And we saw that happen with Senator Lila de Lima. With Lenny Robredo, it went as far as, you know, she was supposedly pregnant, the man that she was supposedly sleep. Um, it's hard to talk about this in civilized society, right? <laughs> uh, the man she was supposedly with, uh, who was another congressman. This was all public, right? And then once you get down to that point, then it's very denigrating attacks. Mm -hmm. And then in the case of Lila de Lima, who was in prison, step three was hashtag arrest Lila de Lima. Um, and then a few weeks later, she was arrested. They've gotten to three steps with me. I've gotten the hashtag arrest Maria Ressa, but um, two, two things stopped it. And the second step in the denigration and the sexual attack, our chief of staff of the military um, one of the attacks, fake news started uh, to say that, uh, I don't know what they, I don't remember exactly, they put out a fake news article, and then over a weekend, a lot of soldiers got involved, and it was, again, very denigrating. I, at that point, I was like, I'm not even going to look. Um, but other people jumped in, and someone uh, actually wrote a piece, uh, an open letter to the chief of staff of the military, and uh, he, on Monday, uh, investigated those men and then apologized publicly. So that was a really welcome uh, event. And then the third part is uh, that same blogger network tried to trend hashtag arrest Maria Arresta. Uh, it was the Trump Duterte letter. So we, we published it in the Philippines, uh, the Washington Post and the Intercept published it in the United States. Based on that, I was supposed to have been arrested because it is, uh, it is traitorous to publish a letter of Duterte and Trump. I mean, sorry, the conversation between Duterte and Trump. Um, it didn't get that far uh, for me. So Lenny Robredo continues to battle. This is the vice president. She continues to fight, but she's conflicted. It's where, where is journalists also have to face this point, right? Mm -hmm. Where do you stop and handcuff yourself because you're not supposed to jump in? Right, advocacy versus uh, merely putting information. Correct. And in this in this environment, those lines are completely different now. Mm -hmm. So Lenny, the the opposition politicians, there essentially is no opposition. They're starting to find their voice as our people are starting to find their voices, um, and we'll have to see. But it is uh, it's a tough battle against you know, state-sponsored online presence. Okay, questions? Yes, here, ma'am. Hi, I'm Catherine Messina Pajic. I'm a freelance consultant and writer. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here and commend your bravery. I have a question about um, how to address the demand side of the equation, because so much attention has been paid rightly to the supply of disinformation, the origins of it, how to expose it, um, who's propagating it. But it seems that there's, at least in the United States, a certain amount of fertile ground for people to believe it, and not only just to be susceptible, but to actually you know, deny truth when it is exposed. So are any of you looking at that question, how to um, look at, I think you mentioned, the weak points in society that can be manipulated and, and taken advantage of. Um, yeah, thank you for this one. And uh, well, this is a headache of uh, everyone, at least of my colleagues I know, who deal with the face checking, because everyone wants this, you know, one pill for, for any of these problems, but there, there are mostly long-term things. So for this one you mentioned, um, there is a long-term thing as education, basically educating people on like critical thinking and on that there will be no uh, conflicting ideas coexisting because most of conspiracy theories and most of fake news we've seen, this is like conflicting ideas coexisting in mind. 
So this one, and educating on what media is, and educating on how to deal with it, and having this, on, on having this space between you and information, not to jump in and, and share and believe, but maybe to, to at least make like primary investigation, like what source it is, what is happening in the title, and, and all of it. But uh, there are great uh, stats made by uh, a lot of organizations, but also about like 30% people able to believe in conspiracy, usually 25. So this is the thing. So uh, I think it was, uh, we've talked with NDI colleagues about uh, pessimistic people being more susceptible to disinformation. And you, for example, can find a lot of pessimistic people uh, around like post-Soviet space, especially. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but not only that, but I mean like, if we know, for example, so that this is one of the reasons we can understand that um, that we, we, might, might, we might target this question as well. But um, um, yeah, workshops, bringing it to attention. Uh, I love the idea about showing the link between like the cigarettes and cancer. So basically maybe showing the, more showing the link between uh, this uh, different, not verified information, not quality information, like junk news, like it's called it, mm -hmm. by Oxford experts as well. So, and some tragic and, and dr drastic events later. So providing the information and how it was said by Senator Cardin, so basically informing this constituency, so informing. Can I? Did you, sure. Yeah, uh, and this, you know Daniel Kahneman's book, mm -hmm. Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. Thinking fast will always mm -hmm. be thinking slow and that's why we journalists are actually handcuffed because we need people to stop and think slow. And this stuff, the way this disinformation is set up, anger and hatred, anger is the fastest emotion to spread, whether it's in the physical world or in the virtual world. So the negative part, I'll start with the negative first. The negative thing is that this is the worst of human nature. That's what we're playing to. And we cannot fight it with rational thought. That's the initial input. You, that's medium term. Because by the time they're thinking slow, they're already they're already heading towards our, our domain. So what do you have to do in the meantime? That's why it's truly important uh, that given the way humans behave, that our cognitive biases will get the best of us even when we don't know it, that we have no, I, we cannot control it. So I go back, uh, why are these, why is fact and fiction equal? It shouldn't be equal, right? Uh, there are actors who want it to be that way, but uh, in the age when journalists were gatekeepers, that certainly couldn't have happened that way. You could argue that, well, that was an elitist world and it, 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 we should make it far more open to everyone. Okay, we can have a far more open, because we've had this on the, on the internet and social media where it's far more open. Um, it really wasn't only until 2015, 2016 that it pushed a step further. I think you're gonna have to pull that back. The only way on, the, on that supply side is, you know, getting to the news that you get. And right now you're getting that news from social media. So immediate short term, what can they, those actions be? A lot of heads nodding at the uh, behavioral psychology problem of this. But <laughs> Phil, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, the, the different countries consume this junk news at different levels. And the countries that seem to consume the, the lowest amounts are the ones that have some kind of public investment in a national broadcaster. And I don't mean, I don't mean government ownership of the media, I just mean some kind of public-private partnership or some kind of um, publicly sponsored national media that um, creates a culture of professional journalism. The second thing is that the countries that do consume the least junk news are the ones with significant, where Western news outlets have a significant foreign desk. Because the first thing that happens when people get junk news is they, they check the BBC, CNN. They, they look for the other Western news outlets that are covering their country just to do the fact check. That's what most citizens do as fact checkers. So having some kind of public broadcaster makes a difference. Having a lot of foreign correspondence in your capital city, mm -hmm. city makes a dis yeah. difference. Yeah. The third thing I'd say on this demand side question is that that even, even if you could change education and um, improve our understanding of argumentative fallacies and fix the news, the most immediate cause of the problem is that the social media firms serve 
junk news to voters in the three days before they vote. Right? In our studies, the proportion of professionally produced news content is always at its lowest the night before you vote. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there are some big picture macro causes, but there's a very proximate cause, the, the delivery of junk at a crucial moment when decisions have to be made. So the fix has to involve the big structural and the proximate stuff. Okay. Back here. Hi, yeah, I'm Andy Keane from TechCrunch. Uh, and it's a question for Maria and on this... Um, I mean, you're, you're, all, you're all kind of dancing around this. You're saying it's a huge problem, and you're coming up with incredibly cosmetic, at best, solutions to this. They're not even solutions. They're, you know, the, the body's being cut up, and you're coming along with uh, plasters for the problem. So I wonder if there's a, a more substantial ways of thinking about this. And, and I'm interested, Maria, in your, in your response on the issue of anonymity, because... I mean, the problem is, is, at least in terms of fake news, is there are a lot of liars, people who are claiming to be one person or actually someone else. And the senator talked about, I think, Susan, you asked a question to the senator about, uh, well, are there other countries with models for fixing this? And he brought up Estonia. And what Estonia's come up with is an ID system where there's a new kind of social contract between citizens and government in terms of anonymity, giving up anonymity online in exchange for kind of accountability in terms of government. So I'm particularly interested, Maria, because given the threat to personal security in the Philippines, what's your position on anonymity? Is it something <laughs> that we should embrace? I mean, liberals in particular, and human rights it's people, have always problem. defended anonymity. But isn't that the problem? But if we're going to have kind of architectural reform of the system, we need to change something substantial. And the real challenge is making everybody accountable for what they say. And in that sense, we have to do away with anonymity, even if it isn't obviously ideal. Um, so, yes, I, I agree with you. So Andrew is also the contrarian of the Internet. We, he came to the Philippines and shocked us. We were at our most optimistic, and Andrew came in and said, you know, this is the way it's going to be. And now, okay, yeah, I'm with you. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I think the anonymity issue works, yes. And I think that Facebook will have to go there because th they're already trying out payment systems, right? They're in China, for example. Um, uh, there are already other ways that you can, you can blend commerce, and that brings <coughs> your credit card, that brings uh, your identity. Uh, but in the Duterte administration, the worst bloggers, the worst attackers uh, of, of perceived critics are not anonymous. Mm -hmm. They've gotten the, you know, they've gotten the pat on the head by the government, and the, and President Duterte himself is the first to attack, for example, the largest television network to say you're not going to get your franchise, or the largest newspaper or Rappler at the State of the Nation address. So. Uh, those things, when you're talking that it, about state-sponsored ways to try to limit freedom of the press or limit speech, that's a whole other ball game that I don't think we've even gone into this yeah, way of talking about it. Um, it's very different from just free speech and inciting to hate. Um, structurally, I think I've been very straightforward, right? I think that the platforms are at the, at the very least complicit by not taking action on, in all of this. Um, and they do need to structurally. It helps. They know. So why is it that all of a sudden when you're called to, to a hearing, mm -hmm. um, names from Russia, the Internet research, these names that have been there forever, all of a sudden begin to un unravel a thread. They need to be pushed to actually unravel these threads faster because I, I'm going to deviate one, one last thing. We talked about how information is really the core of everything, right? And that this is this is a whole trend of Moore's law. It doubles every the amount of information on a chip doubles every 18 months. And na and we've disrupted every industry, and now government has been disrupted in in last year. So how do we fix it? Um, the the gateway the gatekeepers have to go back and tell us what are the rules of the game. They need to put stop signs and say red yell means stop. 
and if you violate it, you'll be taken. The problem is that you can violate, and it's quite random, it's not transparent, and there is no accountability. I think probably everybody wants to get in on this very important question. I, I do think your point, Maria, is very well taken on the, there's anonymity, but we now have arguably a new development, which is uh, a public battle between you know openly named uh, sides in which it's, it's become a part of the political uh, uh, war in, in these countries as well as here. But uh, I know you wanted to get in on this. No, I think the anonymity, so it's, it's uh, some of the platforms, for, for example, Twitter, uh, allow people to be anonymous and that creates some kinds of problems. Facebook uh, tries to do real names, but uh, you can still rent tens yeah. of thousands of fake users uh, to push your messages. So my default is rather than, uh, or my, I'd be more interested in using the rule of law to demonstrate that you, you, you can't lie too much or public find funding for your political campaign gets withdrawn. You know, I'd rather default to the rule of law than micromanage any particular mm. platform's um, anonymity policy. So, I, I would love to continue this one, and uh, I think, and this is precisely what what uh, is stuck in my head, that we definitely get all these great things, systems, and everything. But once we have someone who uses all the system to violate it, we might consider coming up with some ideas, which might be precisely maybe yeah, flagging what is actually uh, what, what we allow and what we do not allow because information space is still in this way to me looks like a gray area basically everything considered because it's free internet or like freedom of speech but maybe we need to consider these threats the same as like physical threats and just to maybe take this to action and definitely like maybe again find media who break the like journalist code maybe uh, pinpoint those who are violating and are trolls and maybe do something about it, considering like tech companies as well. I think we have time for just one more question if it's very uh, quick. So, yes, ma'am. Uh, Elizabeth Wilson, I'm the Rutgers Law School. Probably not a quick question, but I'm just wondering um, to what extent um, the people working on the front lines of this issue, and thank you all for your presentations, very thought-provoking, um, to what extent should we be looking at this as the ultimate cause, the disinformation campaign, and to what extent should we be thinking about it or in connection with it being a, a symptom of a kind of underlying um, alienation from um, democratic institutions that is, you know, cross-fertilized in different countries uh, right now, but maybe has under different underlying causes um, related to the economic um, changes and globalization. Look, I think it's. I think that is a great question. I mean, yeah. you know, is it? Uh, it's the chicken or egg question of this whole controversy. Where do you come down for? So I, what keeps me going in studying all this stuff across many countries is um, the strong feeling that democracy advocates tend to be more creative and more desperate than most authoritarian leaders. Most authoritarian leaders copy, right? They, they, they see what the democracy advocate has done and then they try to copy it and turn these things into tools for social control. So I think, um, you know, we're not going to withdraw the technologies. Uh, we're not going to, uh, we might break up the Facebook monopoly in some countries. You know, that, that, that is one of the options being discussed. But for the most part, the creativity is actually, I think, on the, the democracy advocate side of things. And I, I just have some faith that it's going to bloom again. Okay. Um, yeah, I think definitely what we're seeing, I, I might, Tied with it, that this is a certain symptom of uh, like spreading this mistrust and spreading the doubt. And I think to me, it looks like what is most dangerous that what Russian disinformation did is actually can be used for by whatever organization or like political actor to disrupt uh, the trust and belief inside any state or community. That that's why I think it's so important to understand that we need to 
have this no, new tools to, to face it and to counter it and maybe to flag it and to whatever, to, for, not the, for this threat not to go further. Maria, you get the last word. So when I was with CNN, I had the great privilege of covering the transition to democracy from authoritarian one-man rule of most of the countries in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. People power in the Philippines, Lee Kuan Yew stepping down in Singapore, Mahathir in 2004. Um, and I watched that pendulum swing, right? Mm -hmm. When the pendulum swing in the Philippines, we, it, with each of the leaders, we watched the pendulum. After 21 years, when you let go of the pendulum, it swings wildly like this until it finds equilibrium. Um, you're right. There is a failure in the Philippines of the, of the political elites to bring real, real, the fruits of democracy to the mass base. The, the, the trickle-down theory didn't work. But that doesn't mean that it's also right that disinformation can function. They, they don't can go hand in hand. I, uh, what's happened is the pendulum swing is being pushed back the other way uh, by state actors who want to retain uh, more authoritarian rule and they're able to use tech platforms in exponential ways. So those two things are both happening at the same time and perhaps one of the best things we should be doing is discussing this, really having a societal discussion. In the Philippines, we can't even have that discussion because the, the propaganda machine, what we nicknamed the shark tank, you know, the minute you start to raise anything, you just get bashed. So we need to go back and use these tools for real democracy, which is what it was from 2012 to 2015 in the Philippines. Uh, we were able to find solutions using social media in governance that we've never had before. We can go back to that. It's just now, you've just got to find ways of preventing it from turning into a sewer and being used by autocrats. All right. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no. I want to really, I want to thank all of our panelists. I know I, the audience shares my appreciation for your work and your, your thoughtful ideas. I want to thank NDI for bringing us together this morning. And of course, I want to thank all of you for taking your time to listen to this very provocative and thoughtful discussion. Thank you, Maria Martin. Thank you.